Hobby Farm. I'm your host Jerry Hansen. This will be the final video. In today's video we're just going to talk about selecting the right kind of livestock, the kind of livestock that I chose specifically for my homestead. Uh, I had to weigh the uh, type of environment that I had, the type of land I had. My property is primarily, there's a little bit of a meadow, a couple of streams, a pond, and then there's some oak trees, some groves of oak, and then it goes into a mountain. And up the mountain, I have some a variety of evergreens. We have sugar pine up there, lodgepole pine, Douglas fir. We have a couple of cedar up there, some madrome. So with those in mind, I had to select the type of livestock that would be suitable for this particular homestead. The number one staple for any homestead would be chickens. I chose the Buff Orpington chicken because of their size and their durability. Uh, they're a, a halfway decent egg layer. We don't go through a whole lot of eggs since it's just my wife and myself and sometimes I share them with my kids and my neighbors but we, we are not in it primarily for egg production. We wanted a breed that is a good all-around breed for egg and meat. So these birds weigh out a really nice hefty weight and dress the table really nice. They will lay eggs well into the winter. This is November. Uh, we're going into the second half of November and they're still laying eggs. I haven't supplemented their light with any additional light other than what's going on naturally. So we're still getting eggs, <clears throat> they're get, still getting free range and that's another advantage to having that ch uh, type of chicken. They're very hardy, they're really good about free ranging and feeding themselves so I have to supplement very little their diet. They manage to forage on the whole five acres. Technically it's nine acres that I have here at Pine Meadows Hobby Farm. So they do a good job at keeping the mice population at bay. They keep the snake population at bay and uh, the bugs and especially the ticks. And so you have to switch, you know, change out your chicken flock for about every three years. Your chickens, they're, when they're hatched, they're hatched with as many eggs already in their body as they're gonna lay. And so they're good for about three years of peak production and after that you want to cull them so they'll be dressing the table after that. So every three years or so I will raise a group of chicks. Uh, I have this incubator that I purchased and I've been 50% eh, successful with raising chicks. My hands have been better at raising chicks but I have the incubator just in case. I use the incubator for uh, incubating ducks and uh, geese as well if I have to. But the chickens do a good a job at doing it themselves. So moving on to the uh, waterfowl, I chose the Pekin as a duck that I wanted to raise. Now the primary reason why I chose the Pekin because of its size. It is a good meat bird. Uh, it is a hardy bird. It is able to withstand the winters around here much better because we live up in the Cascade Ranges and they, I have never had any problems with ducks getting uh, frozen um, and dying because of the cold. Of course I, keep them, I give them plenty of shelter and hay to uh, get out of the inclement weather and get warm when they have to. I offer that for them. So no problems with the ducks at all. Uh, we, we feed them as much as they need to be fed and they also do a really good job at going through the garden and the yard 
and around the acreage in getting all the bugs and slugs and snails, the, all the one, uh, critters that they want. So I enjoy ducks. I had, I've had ducks as pets since I was in grade school and throughout junior high and high school and almost throughout my adult life I've had pet ducks. So these ducks are primarily pets. I've never tasted duck yet. I don't know what it tastes like. But eventually I will uh, process a duck and eat it. That's what they're here for. The breed I chose because of the size and I felt that for a farmstead in the event of a, a, a problem like a, a, a a natural disaster or a financial crisis or collapse, whatever's coming that everybody's anticipating, it's always wise to be prepared. Whether it's for that big earthquake, that big earthquake that's going to hit and shake apart the infrastructure and uh, disable services from getting foods from, uh, say, Mexico or Canada down to our neck of the woods, so you have to fend for yourself. So this duck is a good uh, meat source to be able to barter with other neighbors who would like a different variety of meat in their diet. That way I can barter with something that they have that I don't have. So moving on to the geese, I chose the American Buff Goose. The American Buff Goose, there's only about 500 breeding pair left in the world today. They are uh, almost on the verge of going extinct but I'm trying to preserve the flock again I've never eaten goose before uh, I have never butchered a goose yet uh, eventually I probably will but these geese are primarily used for preserving the breed and yes I, I will eat them but the reason why they've fallen into disfavor over the years is the breed was originally, they were, the, they were the original breed, from what I understand, for the American homestead. So they were like the first goose bred for the United States um, uh, farm. But because of their medium size, they fell out of disfavor. Some more people are uh, more favorable with the Emden or the Toulouse, which is a, a, a larger goose, which is a heavier, meatier bird. Uh, I'm not so much into uh, quantity as I am into quality and I find that a medium to small size package has a better quality of meat than a large size package uh, but I don't know that for sure that is just what I'm guessing since I've never tasted goose yet before so that's why I chose the American Buff Goose for my uh, homestead here uh, moving on to rabbits, I was toying around with the possibility of maybe Californian uh, and New Zealand. Now, I've been raising New Zealand for some years now just as a more of a, uh, you know, just one pair of rabbits as a hobby. Raise them, have them babies, sell the babies, that's it. Again, I've never tasted rabbit yet either. But I decided to get into rabbit breeding and I chose the New Zealand. I sold the two Californian bucks that I had and I am going to stick primarily with New Zealand. They seem to be pretty cold uh, tolerant of my climate here in the Cascade Mountains. Again, they produce a lot of meat through the year and you can also use them for bartering in the event of a uh, situation like everybody's planning for. So it's always to be uh, wise in selecting the kind of livestock you want to uh, raise on your property. Rabbits will eat just about anything in nature. They eat grasses, twigs, uh, leaves, plants. They eat a variety of things. So I can go out into the uh, farm here and just cultivate whatever is growing out here and throw it in their... Um, cages and they'll eat it and get just as much nutrition out of that as they do the uh, name brand rabbit food that's formulated for rabbits. So uh, that's another reason why I chose these breeds and these type of animals for the hobby farm because in the event of collapse you're not going to be able to rush down to the local feed store and get the quality uh, prepared uh, foods for your livestock. You're going to have to have 
uh, some ingenuity going on. You're going to have to be able to go out into your surrounding community in the area where you live and be able to cultivate uh, foods that grow naturally for yourself and your uh, pets. Now, moving on from rabbits, uh, we're going to go on to the goats. I chose the Nubian goat. The Nubian is a crossbreed of two different types of goat. I forget what they are right now, but I chose the Nubian. I did a lot of research on the type of goat I wanted. I've raised Nubians uh, since, uh, oh, for about five, six years now. I uh, chose them because they're an all-around good breed for both quality of milk and meat. Now, if you want just a meat goat, you can get a boar goat. Uh, I guess those are pretty good meat goats. And if you want a just a milk goat, a good dairy goat, I believe in La Mancha is a good dairy goat. And there's other breeds out there. Research what you want. I researched uh, for just an all-around um, breed that is both hardy for our environment here where I live and their uh, their uh, ability to be uh, gentle. <laughs> I don't want any mean goats on my property and also their ability to be able to forage on their own. Now these goats are really good. I can just open the gate and let them go out onto the farm. Of course the farm is all fenced off so they can go out and feed themselves throughout the spring, summer, and fall and then I'll just supplement their feed in the winter as I need to and they get the little bit of grain here and there throughout the year. Now I just raised does. My neighbor has a buck so I can take my doe over to my neighbor's house which is just right behind me and uh, we'll breed her buck with my doe and uh, I can uh, have babies and then once the babies are born and weaned uh, I can, while she's lactating then I can milk them and I only do two goats at a time. I raise two goats at a time uh, and when I raise the babies I go ahead and sell those to buy feed. Now I uh, only keep one goat in milk and I try to alter it, alternate the goats. Uh, one goat will be in milk for uh, say a year or so and then the other goat's there for companionship and then I'll breed the other goat and have her in milk for a year or two and then I'll let the other one rest but I'll try to keep them both active as far as breeding and milking goes but not so active that I'm going to wear them down. So I'm very self-conscious uh, and conscientious of my livestock, their needs, and their health. I've uh, learned some animal hud husbandry. I've collected some uh, medicines and stuff that I can give to the goats, like the tetanus shots that they need, because uh, they do get into mischief. <laughs> and they do eat uh, some strange things. On the bees, I am chose to have bees because I just wanted them. I know the pollinators are in uh, decline and so I wanted to help in any little in any little way I can to be able to help um, my neighbors and myself with uh, the pollinating aspect of growing our crops. And besides I like bee barf. I like to hunt a bee honey in uh, different products. It's got a lot of medicinal value to it and also the propolis that the bees coat the inside of their hives with are uh, very medicinal. So that is one aspect why I chose to go ahead and have bees. I'm, I'm only going with uh, maybe a maximum of three hives. I'm not into growing a whole lot of bees uh, uh, cultures or colonies but I just want just a little bit of bees for my little hobby farm and enough to pollinate my plants and little orchard that I'm planting. Thanks. So that's it on the livestock that I've chosen. Um, I am in negotiations with a boss right now and adding the possibility of adding a, a pig. But the pig specifically I want to add is I'm looking into the American guinea hog. 
I am uh, watching some videos from Alderman Farms. Uh, he has some interesting information on the American guinea hog. And also, J&J uh, &J Acres has some interesting information. He accumulated, or he acquired a, uh, some guinea ho American guinea hogs last year. And I wanted to check out to see how his success were. Based on what I know already is these, the American guinea hog is a small hog. It's not big uh, at all. But we're not in, like I said, quantity of meat. We're into quality. And uh, the ability to be able to feed these animals in the event of a collapse of some nature or another, whether it be natural, man-made, or whatever. So uh, the American guinea hog, I understand, is one that you just go out and graze with the goats. That'll eat everything, uh, pretty much the same thing the goats do. So you, uh, as much farm land as I have, uh, I think my farm produces enough that they can be able to uh, uh, eat plenty uh, for the amount of livestock that I'll be maintaining here. So that's about it for this video and for this series. My name is Jerry Hansen. I want to thank you for coming. You can look for us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Google+. I'll see you later in another series as I'm working on it, and I'll be posting some more videos. I have a lot of projects going on this year uh, throughout the winter, so stay tuned. You might be interested in some of these projects. I'm going to try to teach you how to do some stuff. So if you're interested, come on back. Thank you for coming.